Um, uh, I'm like a real big fan of Canada. I shot four movies in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I shot it in Montreal, and it was a great, great time to have there. Um, this was like a, a real labor of love for me. You know, I really, really um, enjoyed making a, a movie, and I want to now introduce you to uh, some of my actors. You know, let's uh, uh, no, no, let's get first like the writer on. John Robin Banks. And then, uh, not uh, in particular order of importance, but uh, let's uh, start with Vlad Alexei. Please raise your hand. Balcony two. Uh, you're all welcome. Yes, go ahead. Why is there such a big fuss about this film? I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question, why is there such a big fuss uh, about yeah. this film? And you loved it. Yeah, I think we were like all surprised about that. You know, this is the first time actually a trailer got boycotted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and we actually very innocently said, let's not give everything away because I hate trailers where you like, cannot see the whole movie and we just wanted to get a taste of the movie. And uh, here we go. So, uh, we like kind of, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, I think our movie speaks for itself. And that's that. Go ahead. Would you rewrite the story based on the original history? Well, you know, I mean, uh, what we did, you know, uh, Robbie and I, we like kind of looked at everything what was there, and uh, what you learn pretty fast, there are like kind of different theories about uh, who threw the brick, who who was there, who was not there. There's like kind of there's a lot of controversy about that. But we said like to ourselves, what we know for sure was, you know, that you know um, the riot was started by a lesbian. We have that, and. Um, we know for sure, you know, there were like kind of some homeless kids there who like kind of uh, really fought the hardest, and uh, that's what we portrayed. This was also like a little bit in, in, um, in inspired by the fact that I started seeing like in the Gay and Lesbian Center in Los Angeles, you know, their uh, homeless youth program, and all of a sudden it made sense for me to put like kind of these kids in the center of it because uh, this problem still exists today. That's uh, how many, you know, like kind of 40% uh, of uh, all homeless youth is uh, LGBT. So that's like just uh, a fact which you cannot ignore. Uh, ignore. Yes? Um, first, I just want to acknowledge the cast. I think you did a phenomenal job. <laughs> The question was about the cast, how Roland found the cast, <laughs> put the cast together. I always like to take casting very seriously. Uh, I have sleepless nights. Uh, I, you know, uh, watch uh, a lot of auditions. Uh, but sometimes I'm also the, know immediately, you know, who I want. This was. Uh, <laughs> I only met one actor for that part, <laughs> and pretty much of it in the meeting. Right? So anyhow, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, it's like kind of, a, it's a long and very um, complicated process because of, it's not so easy to find, you know, um, these uh, actors and I found all these actors who were incredibly talented and uh, we had so much uh, fun shooting this film because, uh, you know, it's like, it's like kind of, it's a little bit like a family and we still have reunions. And uh, I, I became the Bob Kohler of, of Los Angeles. <laughs> yes? Um, I would assume that the, the central storyline is completely fictitious, you know, with, with your stars. But um, how did the writer go about 
having a fictitious <laughs> central story if you talk about the process of merging that Intensity. Questions for John about uh, creating the fictitious story around these uh, real historical events and challenges of that. Well, you know, you, you, you just place a version of some version of, of you or a composite. You know, Ragtime, for instance, uh, a wonderful novel by E.L. Dr. and a great movie, takes really vivid historical events and puts a bunch of people with, within the you use the framework, really, and you know kind of the events. I, I, I think in the case of, of the character of Danny, uh, Roland actually had a very clear sense of, of who that young man was going to be based on a series of conversations of people who knew, and we had a lot of discussions about it, and I, I, uh, I thought that was, that was sort of a, a compelling character to put in uh, in the middle of that maelstrom. Anytime you take someone who's, who's sort of thinks of themselves as just an ordinary person, I think, and, and you thrust them into the middle of, of a storm and they take action, you have a kind of drama. They take action because they discover their power. And that's who Danny turns out to be. Uh, and he does it with the help of a lot of other empowering themselves people. So, um, you, you know, you can't be slavish, I think. You have to think of it, I, I don't think of it as any different to writing a play or, or um, it's just the rules of the thing. Put someone in a place and time and let them do what they need to do. So did you have to adapt the history at all to your storyline? Not at all, no. I. I it, it, it isn't as I've like as I've said many times. It, I, we don't think of this as the definitive story of the Stonewall Rebellion. Um, we think of it the story as the story of one person and uh, a group of kids uh, in the in the middle of an event, uh, and that's that's sort of it. it. To be slavish to to sort of some literal. Chronology. Also, by the way, um, the Stonewall Rebellion was so spontaneous that there's very little actual recorded fact of it. It was, it was sort of boom, impromptu, and this is before the age where some kids in Tawir Square can Instagram the horror as it's happening. You know, the first reports in, for instance, the Village Voice were incredibly dismissive and derisive, of all places. Um, queen bees stung, sting cops was, I think, the headline. Right. And you, it, it took a, a lot of research, not, not necessarily by us, but uh, there's some really wonderful first-hand accounts that you glue together. I'm sorry, this is such a long answer. <laughs> I can feel myself falling asleep. <laughs> Questions. Is there anyone in the balcony? I can't see if there are hands up there. Yes, go ahead. Tell us what your process was like in developing your Tell us what your process was like in developing your characters. Okay. The uh, I can speak personally. Personally, um, but I, I've been familiar with the Stonewall Rebellion and the riots. Um, I was a gender and sexuality studies minor in, in college, um, so I was kind of very privy to the world. But um, upon reading it, I, there were a few people that really inspired me. Um, Sylvia Rivera was one of them that I just was really taken with, and I had always kind of wanted to find a way to channel her in an artistic medium. I just felt like a lot of people didn't know enough about her. Um, I'm also really tickled that like now a lot of people know a lot about her, and everyone wants to talk about her, which is cool. Um, and I actually used a lot of music. Um, to kind of get into like the realm of things. So I started with the Stonewall Dude Box, and then I kind of gravitated towards uh, the Margolettes, specifically the Shangri-La, um, the Supremes for Finesse, and uh, you know, the Chicans, and those groups. And that's like what the boys know. We all basically lived together um, in like an apartment, and so we just had like the, that kind of music playing all the time. And we were just always together, like we ate together, we like slept in the same quarters really, like we worked together, it was really kind of like that. So I think that's why we were, everything's so tight-knit for us. 
Um, yeah, just like Johnny, like I did some research uh, before even knowing about uh, the movie. So I was, I had a little knowledge about that. And then we, I personally got to meet some of the veterans uh, like Martin Boyle and Danny, Danny McGarvin who uh, passed away last year. And um, just hearing their story and their account and them telling us that it was a group effort, you know, it wasn't just one group that um, participated in it. It was, you know, lesbian, gays, trans, straight people, black people. It was really a group effort, and that's what we try to show in, in the movie. But honestly, I think we all, like, we all helped each other in this casting process. Like, we all helped each other, and we, you know, kind of feed off um, each other's energy. And because we were very close, we had a lot of dance parties, uh, <laughs> crazy dance parties. Um, it was great, you know, we got to know each other and appreciate each other, appreciate each other's um, improv moments and, and our energies. Um, I am a lesbian and an actor and I've been out for a really long time. And uh, when I heard that this movie was being made, I was like, oh, I gotta be in that movie. I, I, I don't even care what I, I will be a doormat, I will be a light bulb, I will be a I just didn't really care. I was like, I that movie. <laughs> well, I was a light bulb. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> it was, it was, I was red, yeah. Uh -huh. um, but but I think for me it was uh, on, on a lot of levels it was an incredibly emotional and uh, important uh, empowering experience because very rarely do lesbians and gay and transgender people get to be in Hollywood movies or, or many movies for that matter and I, I think that this was a moment in time in history and I think Roland Emmerich is um, brilliant for bringing it to the forefront because a lot of people actually had no idea what the Stonewall Riots were about. A lot of people in our own community don't know about the Stonewall Riots and whether or not it's historical, dramatic, or you know, has a lot of lesbians, a little lesbian, a lot of black people, a lot of trans, it's an awesome film and I feel like it's gonna be something that propels us into the future to create more programming, more characters that are LGBT, more inclusiveness, and I think it's just it's the tip of the iceberg and I'm just really proud to be part of this ensemble. See, I'm playing a black transgender character. <laughs> no, you know, I think, um, you know, for me, it was, I think there's, there's parts of Danny's character we can all relate to. We've all felt um, like we don't belong at some point. We've all had those feelings of rejection. I think um, there's a lot of things that I could draw on. Like these guys, they, you know, we did a huge amount of research. Um, I was ashamed at how little I knew about the Stonewall Rights, I think, before, before, you know, we really started to delve into it. So, um, yeah, a lot of that, and then also I was lucky to meet a few people who I, I knew personally who had uh, similar experiences and were very kind and kind of really opened up to me about stuff, so. Yeah, but mostly it was just working with these guys, and you know, Roland was uh, an incredibly brave director in that he let us, he let us improvise. And it kind of takes, you know, someone of Roland's caliber to, to be able to let, let you do that. And you know, there were times when me and Johnny would finish our scene and no one would say cut and we'd go for like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't hear cut, I, I will just yeah. keep going. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, I mean, that, that it, was such, it was a very immersive process. I mean, I hate the word yeah. mess, I think it's irrelevant, but you know, I was working with actors who really were those characters on set. Yeah. What attracted you to this specific story? Well, it's uh, it's quite simple. I mean, uh, no, it's actually not simple. It's uh, it's super complicated. Um, uh, no, it is um, because uh, I look. I I always uh, I never wanted to become a gay film director because uh, when I was in film school, 
I was always like saying, you know, I want to be, you know, like, you know, like Steven Spielberg or George Lucas or, or any one of these uh, American directors. They actually hated me there for that. Uh, I was like kind of the black sheep of uh, the Munich Film School because, um, uh, and then, you know, over the years, you know, naturally I made it to Hollywood, which is a whole other story, but uh, at one point, you know, I got constantly this question, when do you do a personal film? When do you do, when do you do, you know, like kind of something uh, different? And, uh, and I actually did something different. Uh, I did like Anonymous, which was um, a total labor of love uh, too. And, uh, and then, you know, like, uh, uh, two producers, you know, like uh, Mika from Sir, who sits down there. Woo! And, uh, and said, uh, what about Stonewall? Why you don't do Stonewall? And I said, yeah, Stonewall would be uh, made. You know, it's a very important story. And then whatever happened there, it was like a series of events. It's always like a series of events which gets you interested in something. And then I started, you know, seriously, you know, like kind of considering uh, this film on the I got with uh, Robbie together. We like kind of talked a lot about what this story could be, and and all of a sudden, you know, I had like a script, and then I was super surprised. Nobody wanted to do it. <laughs> I mean, nobody. <laughs> you know, it was like they all said it's a great script, and I said, yeah, and, uh, and it was just a fact, you know, that it's a movie about homeless youth. It's uh, it's really it's really quite interesting. It's like probably. Um, uh, because like uh, a homeless youth, there is no movie star who can play a homeless, right? Uh, there is no movie star in a central character. And that's what like kind of actually uh, makes movies, you know, somebody like uh, Sean Penn plays Harvey Milk. And, but I was then, you know, insistent and we somewhat doubled up the money and figured it out. And, uh, and now I'm like kind of, I have to say, I'm so glad I did it because um, I think now everybody knows about um, Stonewall, which was like my idea. Question. What do you think about the, the trend kind of a civil rights and, and uh, human rights movies and, and Stonewall being part of that? Oh. The general power of movies too. Deep. Well, it's like kind of when you ask Hollywood, it's Marvel. That's the power of movies. Uh, let's make another superhero movie. Uh, that's what like kind of really happens in Hollywood right now. It's like very sad. But um, you have to still keep up the good work. You have to still, uh, there's luckily a lot of directors out there who, like me, you know, um, you know, try fight hard to kind of create you know movies which like need something. Uh, and uh, sometimes you also have the chance, you know, to do a movie which uh, is like a big movie and means something. I tried this in Day After Tomorrow, where I, like took on the. Uh, you know, like I'll try to kind of warn people about what we're doing to our earth and stuff. But it, it basically, it's uh, I think we need more of these films, and it's mainly the audience who has to start showing up because uh, you cannot make movies about having success. And so I'm always like kind of wonder about that because um, when you like talk uh, to people and the, you know like kind of just friends and stuff, and they, they say, "Well, there's not really good movies out there," and I said. Yes, they are. Yeah. You know, you have to just go and see them. <laughs> you know? and, and that's what like really the problem is. It's like you think a little bit and it's it may, mainly it's the marketing power of the studios which like kind of is so loud, you know, with all their releases that you have a hard time uh, to uh, get an independent film out uh, into the series. And also I want to touch base on uh, another issue in the movie that not a lot of people are talking about, but the police brutality. You know, it's very present in the movie and something that's going on, that's been going on for years and years. And because of social media these days, uh, now we're talking about it. But even when we were doing the movie, we didn't anticipate that, you know, marriage equality was going to um, be accepted and uh, trans issue would be more, you know, 
visible on, on screen in, in the media. So we just did it for, out of love because we knew that there was a story that needed to be told um, for kids out there that don't know how to deal with their sexuality or you know middle aged people that are still in the closet and don't know how to tell their family. So it was really a story for them and for our community and for the kids out there to know that it's okay to be who you are. Just love and accept. And fight. And fight, and fight for your rights. You know? And that is a beautiful note. And this is the biggest Q&A. Please